I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Carl Weimer. And Carl has pioneered all types of optical sensors, okay, that use lasers and other, other optical sources for remote sensing. And uh, he's been particularly interested in sort of the practical side of this of how is a system uh, that is going to do remote sensing uh, made highly reliable okay, so that it can actually be you know, field deployed and, and put into even space systems. And most recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, he's been uh, involved at Ball Aerospace, actually working on real systems uh, for NASA space programs. Um, some of the awards that Carl has received for his work include the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal in 2008 for work in advancing the LIDAR technologies in space for the Calypso program. And so please uh, join me in welcoming Carl Weimer. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for the nice the opportunity to um, come speak at this. This is, in my view, I've been watching <coughs> laser frequency combs since their invention in 2000, roughly, wondering when we, they would ever be um, ready to come out of the lab. And so it looks to me, talking with the folks at NIST, that we're starting to see that we're getting there. <coughs> so I'm happy to be here to be part of that. And um, for those of you who don't know Ball Aerospace, we're a mid-size aerospace company that spun out of University of Colorado over 50 years ago. And my part of it has been, um, my section has been really focused on how do we support scientists in moving um, ideas into space in order to make measurements and to advance science. And so the company tries to capture that in some of these things. And we build instruments for NASA, we high rise um, here, pictures of Mars. The Hubble instruments now are we're all built at Ball. Um, we don't even go through some of the recent ones. We built for JPL and Ames, the uh, Kepler instrument for exo exoplanets, Landsat 8 for um, the USGS. And uh, on New Horizons, we built the Ralph instrument that's adding color to Pluto as on a daily basis. So um, you won't see laser frequency combs in this talk because I'm kind of backing up and looking at just lasers, and I'm looking at what it does it take to get lasers and precision electro-optic systems to space. And so I'll do a little bit on that, uh, the path from lab to space. And then um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on NASA. There are other funding agencies um, that do this work, but NASA is obviously one of the focuses. So I would do most of my work with them. I won't touch too much on the space environment, but you'll see that. And then I'll use as an example the Calypso mission and, um, and how it worked. This is a picture of the laser beam coming down from Calypso. It's a laser radar. There's the beam. You're asking about power levels. That's about four watts of average laser power. It's pulsed. And you can see also you don't get time, much time to make a measurement because it's going by at seven kilometers per second. But we have people. Um, I work with who like to go out and take pictures of satellites for fun, and so they get, we're able to capture those pictures. Just to illustrate, we lasers are in space. So, um, in talking with um, Scott, and Nate, and with Mike Shaw, um, I said I would give some of the background um, of how to move this path from lab to space um, in the NASA-centric world. And so I'll give kind of the introductory part and then uh, fill in with one example and then Mike will give more details later. So in the end, this is, I've been watching scientists over the last 15 years working on creating new pr um, ideas and trying to get them out of the lab into space. And so in the end, compelling science has to be defined. And what is compelling science to NASA, it means the um, scientific objectives that they're not creating. It's the NRC Decadal Survey ultimately has been tasked in the National Academy of Sciences to give direction to the science mission director at NASA. And so they, they, this is what they tend to look to. 
And they also generate their own internally generated uh, roadmaps in order to um, lay out the path towards uh, where to go. And in the end, it requires that this science can best be done and that it can be done in space. They don't want to put it there just because it can, but that there's some over uh, compelling reason for that. And so then we start down the road of starting mission feasibility studies and where you define a mission architecture and then you start looking at risks, complexity, maturity. And so that's where Nate and Scott have started pointing out that one, there's compelling science um, that can be done in the lab. Is it compelling for space? And now they're showing that they're starting to be, and others in the community, I should say, they're showing that there's um, starting to be the complexity and maturity are starting to get far enough along. And then I don't want to underestimate the impact of cost estimation early on. Cost estimations will define whether this is possible and whether NASA can afford something like that. So these are the initial steps that you'll see repeatedly done. And then the intermediate steps is mission ha it starts to be marketed to the community. And, I would, and this is part of the community for laser frequency combs. And the key role throughout of champions, champions are individuals who make and push and create and, and it can be scientific champions and it can be champions of the political background scene too. But there, it takes a force of will throughout. And I, to my experience, I don't think I've seen any missions that have moved forward without somebody physically, emotionally commitment to it. So the instrument maturity <coughs> relevant to space is advanced in about any way possible because, so by maturity, we mean focusing on the subsystems and we've seen quite a bit of them defined today. We look at, especially the ones that haven't flown previously in space and pretty much most of the things that we're seeing today haven't been flown in space and so uh, that, those are, the, those are considered high risk and we'll come back to that. There's a language used at the NASA and the DOD world called technology readiness level and so TRL levels and we can talk about that offline but in the end it's just is it literally, is it started in the lab, you get it out of the lab, you get it to, into testing on an environment that's relevant to space and then once you reach that level which is called TRL 5 or 6 then you can start to uh, be taken seriously for moving it to space, with some exceptions. So, as I point out, this is a path. There's multiple ones that we'll allude to in a moment. And then the final steps of getting something to space, you know, it's you complete this mission architecture, and this is where the scientists are critical in defining what needs to be done in order to make the scientific measurements. And then there start to be the trade studies on options with performance and cost in mind. And these are the tra trade studies is the terminology in, in uh, engineering world where you start to say, well, what are, can I afford that? Does it really do what I need to do? Can I find a less expensive approach? Can I find something that's more rugged? And so, and um, then you start the difficult dis discussions of D-scopes and what, what, are the what are the true science requirements needed in order to achieve the mission architecture. And this get, kind of gets back to Nate's comment about evolutionary versus revolutionary. A lot of people focus on the revolutionary, but it's a large step forward, and that step may be too much to achieve. Um, and um, so there's a lot of fear of that in this day and age. But what I'm laying out is a little bit more of a stepwise approach, which will sh illustrate that there's ways to get there. So in the uh, terminology of aerospace, you do the flow down of requirements from science to design, and that's done every day in the science world, but, um, but now you're gonna be working with larger teams and larger teams of engineers who have different languages, different experiences. So depending on the size of the mission, you have to flow these requirements down, that's called, and that's just show a logical. And I'd like to say that it's, it's so logical, it should be easy, but for some reason, <laughs> it's very difficult to achieve. Uh, and then um, you hear about space qualification. And so what is space qualification? And that's, it's a creation and Im implementation of a qualification plan. And a plan that, um, and you can go to the NASA guidebooks, there's thousands of pages written on this, but in the end, you have to look at, for example, the environmental conditions for the launch and orbit that 
they have to be defined for where do you want to go? Do you want to be in low Earth orbit or do you want to be in a trailing orbit or are we heading towards Europa? Or are we, what? Those are all very different environments. Um, you have to look at the risks to instrument success. And there's risks that are associated primarily with the technical risks of the technology. There can be um, mission level risks, but this drives a lot of what comes later on. And that, you have um, materials and processes, there are specialists, and I think that coming out of the labs, we were all our own specialists at some point, or we had those experts in the, uh, in the machine shops or somebody who could help us, but you know, there's a lot of tension here. Uh, materials and process engineers go through, and I'll have some examples in a moment for what they'll study. And there's a natural tension related to this between COTS, so commercial off the shelf, and full traceability. So by full traceability, that's kind of the traditional approach that for aerospace for a full up mission, where you know where that every bit of material on that satellite has come from, all the way down to the um, certificates on the aluminum that you're putting on there. And you know what every process was that touched that aluminum afterwards and it's been certified. So that's a full traceability, but it's obviously very expensive because uh, of the rigor demanded. And so you, there's a lot of talk, there's always a lot of talk about commercial off the shelf. Why don't I just buy it and put it in space? It works here in the ground, why won't it work there? And there's a, there's a time and place for this. And there's uh, a blending between these two where you can take commercial off the shelf and do some level of testing and to try to get it ready. And that's kind of the, what you have to do in the mid-size programs. There's an electronics parts program defined that matches the level of risk. That is, can I live with um, the risk of having to reset the computer every week, every month? Um, how often do I have to do my calibrations? So radiation is a critical part of that for these electronics programs. And then you create a test program because in the end, you know, you wanna test the, the mantras, test as you fly, that's not really achievable, but you test as close as you can. And what do you test? Well, you test the areas where there's the greatest risk. And as I mentioned, qualification is expensive and it's time consuming. And there's different approaches that you can try to do to get by some of that. For example, uh, a lot of the innovative new ideas come out of small companies. And in the US, they can access the small business innovative research funding. And so if you can, uh, you can this is, get, this with some discipline can help move some of these technologies forward. But the warning is that most of the parts that you'll see and seen this morning are probably have, um, have not been studied for qualification and especially if they're state of the art. And so um, at the workshop this week, I think we get to hear from some of the European folks who have started down this road. And so we'll see, uh, learn, learn from their, their successes. In general, I, the NASA science missions, just as one last summary slide, is kind of, there's kind of, you can break them down in different ways, but there's risk tolerance of new technologies is handled differently in the different types of programs. And unfortunately, um, one of the lessons that NASA is learning, and I don't think it's quite correct, is that they, they're blaming cost growth on new technologies. And they're saying it's risk driven, new technologies, you don't go into a flight program with any new technologies because that's what drives your costs up. I think I would say that this is probably not quite true. It's not the new technologies, but a lack of um, systems engineering discipline towards understanding how to qualify them. And so um, the, 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 the downside of this is if you fear new technologies, you're gonna probably not be pushing science in, into new areas. So we have to, always look and find ways that we can start to do this. And the laser frequency comb is an excellent example of that. Um, the, the, the labs of the world have demonstrated a science, they've demonstrated the, uh, that the risks are starting to be manageable. So three types of missions, the higher risk ones, where higher risk is acceptable. These are called technology demonstrators. They're lower cost, they're maybe one year of operations. So you, these, Examples might be the ISS missions, where you have, for example, the Cold Atom Lab going to ISS. It's currently still looks like it's available until 2024 at this point, and maybe it'll be extended further. There's obviously higher risk, but they're 
can be no risk to astronauts. So, and there can, and there can, in the end, risk to humans is no, never acceptable. Whether it's the eye safety that Nate was just talking about, or the eye safety at, to the astronauts, um, y there's a lot of um, talk about um, nanosats and cubesats and small sats, and there's it's a very exciting area right now. And it's a great area because it's um, forcing a paradigm shift away from the high reliability to let's look and find ways to get to space on a cheaper way that will give better access. And so you, the basic economics are changing at some level. Um, the, the, these started out you know, more for educational purposes, for training people, for how to, um, training students and how to put, um, how to create satellites and put them in space. And a lot of those had a very low um, success rate, but at some level you get to define your own success. So if you've made it to space, you succeeded at some level. But I think from a science community, I don't think most scientists would be very satisfied with spending two or three years of their life creating an instrument and then have it go to space and then not work. An, an example recently was a microwave sounder up on a um, CubeSat and the instrument worked great. Unfortunately, the RF link didn't work great, so they can't get their data off. And so I um, can't believe how frustrating that must be. Of course, it's also frustrating to see the rocket carrying your five years worth of work going to the ocean too. But if you're gonna do it, you wanna be serious about it. Secondary payloads, sounding rockets, these are all good ways to get, try to burn down risk, as they say. And I think we're, we'll hear from Menlo on their, I hope to hear from Menlo on their sounding rocket success. Um, these lower risk ones, these are more focused science missions, they're medium cost. I'll just, um, these tend to be competed with a principal investigator and um, you'll hear Earth Science Divisions or SMEX, I mean uh, Earth Venture or SMEX or some of these different programs. These are competed and they're evaluated through the TIMCO office. TIMCO is, um, is technical mission cost. They're an independent office run out of headquarters that looks at every one of these competed missions and evaluates their um, chances of success. And that's part of the, you're, you're checked on your science um, and you're checked on your feasibility. And um, this is, tends to be run, uh, a lot of aerospace engineers who are looking at large databases of past experience and what's been risky, what succeeded, what hasn't in the past. Um, again, but it's this balance, this compelling science aligned with NASA objectives balanced against feasibility as judged by the TIMCO office. And um, so one of the things that some people run into is, is that they say, well, I've tested this in the lab for, for three years and it's working great. Or I have put it on an aircraft and I've flown it for the last two years and a thousand missions, I'm ready for space. This, this doesn't fly with TIMCO. In the end, it has to be the space environment, and that, that means the launch environment and space. So putting it into an aircraft does not gain you much, except for maybe autonomy. So these tend to be uh, one to three kind of year missions. And then the lowest risk are the uh, high impact science missions, high cost, five to 10 years of operations. These are the ones that you'll see prioritized in the National Research Council decadal surveys. Um, these are the, each, uh, the Earth Science one is just starting up again now, astrophysics, planetary, helio. And, um, but this, this is where you'll find the Mars Science Labs, the, um, the James Webb Space Telescope. These are the, um, most of the, what's called a directed decadal survey. Um, in this is kind of, a, in, in generally speaking, these are, in NASA these days, about a billion dollars and hot up for, that, for these. You're not expected to be able to do that for under a billion. James Webb is up at six to eight maybe, but um, these are usually competed um, and they will range from 30 million to up to 800 million kind of range. 
And then these are buried, you know, the money comes from different locations, um, ISS missions. Because you have a lot of safety concerns, you, you have to have enough, so something in the 10 to 20 million maybe. But, if, but there's ways to short circuit that through um, the nanosats. Um, the inexpensive ones, you know, especially with the uh, CubeSat launch initiative, which gives you a free launch, these can be done for under a million dollars easily, especially with students. Um, and um, so it depends on your objectives, but is that kind of, so that's kind of the uh, cost breakdown range. So I just wanted to give uh, one example, um, and then I think Mike has a number of other examples from the astrophysics. This is an earth, earth science example uh, from a mission called Calypso that I worked on. This is what the satellite looked like. The, the picture I showed at the start, the lasers, this is the payload, this is the, uh, the spacecraft, the, uh, the uh, uh, solar arrays are folded in there. This was a, one of the mid-size missions. It was called what's called an Earth System Science Pathfinder mission. Um, it's a medium risk. It's, used, its goal is to study aerosols and clouds and their radio impact to the Earth. I'll come back to that in a moment. And the principal investigator is Dave Winker from NASA Langley. It holds three instruments, a dual wavelength polarization sensitive LIDAR. So as you heard Nate talk about a LIDAR, this type of LIDAR is not looking at hard targets, though. It's a LIDAR that looks at the um, scattering from aerosols and clouds distributed inside of the atmosphere of the Earth. So you're getting a full three-dimensional view of the Earth as it flies through. Um, since it wants to know radiative properties, it also has an infrared imaging radiometer on board, and it has a cloud camera to, uh, so that you're imaging and um, understanding thermal properties and looking at scattering properties altogether. It's in a 705 kilometer orbit, sun sync, that means it comes over the equator at the same time every day, and it's part of an A train of uh, satellites. These are all environmental sensing satellites. Um, and it's been on orbit about nine and a half years with a goal of three years, and it's still meeting all of its requirements. So its path to space, so it was, um, it came out of <coughs> compelling science associated with aerosol and cloud impact on the Earth's radiation budget, as done by a pretty broad group of researchers throughout the world. Um, they, uh, for example, this is where they started to understand the role of aerosols on um, at a, um, atmospheric chemistry that was um, creating the ozone hole. Um, the, uh, NASA Langley's worked on um, pushing, beginning in the 1960s, the study of backscatter LIDAR to characterizing atmospherics uh, and aerosols impact. And then from the 60s on, one of the, as soon as they got satellites up, the weather satellites, you know, they were starting to photograph clouds and starting to understand what's the larger impact of clouds on, um, on weather, you know. They, um, and then early on, they started using what are called limb sounders, which are passive instruments that look through the limb of the, of the atmosphere and get to understand those aerosols. So this was started as early as the 60s, probably predated that, but, the, um, but eventually then it started moving towards uh, getting the technologies ready. And so the LIDARs were demonstrated on the shuttle. Um, it helped to explore those initial mission, initial mission architectures, advance the technology readiness, um, some examples where Langley did the light mission on the shuttle, and, and NASA Goddard has done the shuttle, shuttle laser altimeters, which were the forerunners of ISAT. And um, there were champions developed, uh, de developed an international team, because as I mentioned, this was a um, US-French collaboration. And then the key technology for this mission was the Q-switch diode pump solid state laser. Um, it was, um, this, uh, when it came time to start writing the proposals to try to win this mission, though, the uh, TIMCO office decided that this technology was too high of risk. And, and the, the examples that had flown weren't, didn't demonstrate enough lifetime to justify the medium risk of the mission. And so, um, so, um, 
my organization, Ball and NASA Langley, decided that an investment needed to be made to build a lifetime unit and prove that this thing could meet the environment and would exist, uh, could um, show a full lifetime and that a three-year mission. So we built this risk reduction laser. And it was com and before we even rebid, it was demonstrated that it could do a full three-year mission. In fact, um, it was finished in about 2002, and it's still uh, we just got it off the shelf recently, and it's. We're running it in vacuum right now to help um, understand uh, Clipso's end of life expectations, let's say. As an example of some technologies, this is just highlight of uh, Clipso, uh, the Calliope LiDAR on Clipso. It's a graphite bench, high stability graphite bench, low CTE, uses two photomultiplier tubes, an avalanche photodiode, and has uses an, uh, a low finesse optical uh, contacted etalon. And I'll kind of show you some of the challenges for each of these in a moment. So one meter beryllium telescope, and then um, has dual lasers mounted to a passive radi radiator. Uh, I think that both Scott and Nate mentioned the issue of uh, wall plug efficiency. Wall plug is a critical aspect but it depends a little bit on the mission you're trying for. If you're trying for a CubeSat, you're going to be somewhere down in the 10 watts or less uh, total power, wall plug power, you've got to fit into. This mission, this is about a 200 watt, 250 watt mission. So about 100 watts of that went into the lasers. Um, on the end of the lasers are beam expander optics. The reason for those is what Nate mentioned, laser eye safety. Um, so when you're down on the ground, we, uh, laser eye safety is guaranteed. This is a, a 1064, 532 nanometer laser, and so eye safety is challenging. So how we do it, did it was these, are, these beam expanders expand the beam out to on the ground, you're at 70 meter footprints. And so, um, so that dropped, the, uh, dropped us below the uh, eye safety maximal, maximum permissible exposure limits um, for with margin, with binoculars. So, uh, so let me look now, dig in a little bit, look at some of these different ones and the technology. As I mentioned, the laser qualification was critical. Um, we worked with, it's a pump neodymium YAG. It was manufactured by FiberTech with uh, Ball and NASA's help for working the space aspect of it. FiberTech designed a cross poral prism, very um, optically alignment in, ruggedized so that um, you can see these, these are the, here's the diode nid jag slab. It uses an active Q switch. Um, and then there's a second harmonic crystal in an oven, each of these things. So the, the Q switch is a KD star P. It's an old style Pockel cell. This is active. We have now flown passive Q switches. Um, KTP, second harmonic crystal held in an oven in order to um, reduce some radiation effects. Um, 220 millijoules total, 20 hertz, 20 nanosecond pulses. So obviously, see, we're in the nanosecond. We're not in the femtosecond regime, so that's going to be one of the new challenges. Um, this is not single frequency, multi-TM mode. And that, the reason for multi-TM mode was because that improved the efficiency, uh, wall plug efficiency. And then, as I mentioned, the full lifetime laser. So this is kind of a flow. It's in the aerospace world. This is pretty common. It just shows the blocks you go through. This is the qualification testing blocks. You go through thermal vacuum tests and seal tests, thermal cycling and burn-ins. This is just trying to take out a little bit of, um, of uh, infant mortality and performance tests and then vibe tests and functional tests and thermal vacuum tests. And so it's all, and then you go, that's just the test flow before this laser was delivered, and then it went up to the next level and it was retested again. So <laughs> tests upon tests. But you want to find out where you have mistakes early on. The vibration levels, you work through a spec power spectral density. Um, overall, that's about 12 Gs RMS. It's hard to get a perspective on that. I put down what a roller coaster does, but that's pretty benign compared to what really happens. <coughs> um, so. The lessons learned, this was from our fiber tech partners, use mature laser technologies, um, use alignment and sensitive resonator designs. 
develop a stringent contamination control plan. Um, contamination control is a key aspect of high reliability on lasers. Um, obviously, you can burn, everybody here has probably burned optics at some point, and um, you can't afford to go backwards. If you've got it all built up and you've got to tear everything back down, then you have to redo all of that testing again, and so the cost, so stringent contamination control. Um, Optical components are derated levels. You're in the lab, you get a, if you burn an optic, you get another one out, you put it in, and you hopefully dial down your power a little bit. But here, you can't do that. It has to work from when you build it to three years in space. So derating just means to drop, the, um, drop it below the damage thresholds on everything. And then just a statement that it's expensive for space qualification of electronics. So here's a few, here's an example of the radiation impact on the detectors. So we use have both photomultiplier tubes and silicon avalanche photodiodes. As I mentioned, we're in the 705 kilometer orbit. That takes us through the South Atlantic anomaly. That's where uh, the lower and Allen belt dips a little bit. And um, so you can see that over here. It's, the bar doesn't show up very well, but it's like 50 to 2,000. The South Atlantic anomaly, you just so you're flying through and you're getting beaten up by electrons and protons as you go through here. There was no damage to the PMTs, but um, when you're flying through, this is just, you can see these are s different orbits. You can just see the noise rise as it goes through. The silicon avalanche photodiodes do get damaged. They get damaged by uh, proton displacement damage of the semiconductor itself. And um, so your dark noise rises with time. And so you have to plan that in so that you have adequate signal to noise at the end of your three year mission. Um, this is to illustrate the um, somewhat violence <laughs> of the launch. This is uh, the beam expander optic is a pretty precise optic. It's a F.9 um, Cascaranian. This is all zero doer substrates, parabolic, lambda over 20 surfaces. Um, we, uh, what you see here are titanium flexures. Those are flexures are used to take out the uh, disconnect between the CTEs of different materials. So they flex with temperature. So uh, a lot of analysis went into this, um, structural analysis to identify all of the modes. And um, it was viewed as fairly low risk. There isn't much mass up here. You can see the final articles here mounted on the uh, lasers. Unfortunately, that was the beginning and end. In between, it went on to a vibe table, and that's the secondary optic sitting there. And so th there wasn't an engineering unit built. It was viewed low risk, so we went directly to flight, and it failed in vibration. The graphite structure uh, sheared right here and dropped. We, in order to understand and follow through with the aerospace process, we rebuilt it as, as is and then we loaded it with accelerometers, and then we found out what the reasons were for this failure. We identified five different ones. We went then redesigned, rebuilt, and retested. And so that's, so the, um, we, uh, you've heard about optical frequency uh, cavities used. This is maybe the most simplest one. This is the simple fabry Perot etalon. It's a, um, but to, I wanted to put this in to illustrate some subtle effects, too. Uh, you saw the violent effects of vibration, but there's subtle effects, too. First of all, you have to survive thermal, which is typically maybe minus 30 to plus 60. Those are survival. That's not operating. That's survival. So you are, you're unpowered, usually. You have to survive that. you got to make sure all your dissimilar uh, materials don't uh, fracture each other as they move. Um, so creating a mount for that is challenging. So here's the etalon, uh, it's a 128 micron thick etalon, solid etalon, uh, between two chunks of uh, thick, uh, silica, few silica substrates that were held inside of here. Finesse is of about 18, it's optically contacted. Um, so, but we had a requirement that we had to, and you can see it here inside of this, and again, here are the flexures that take out the mismatches. This is all aluminum here, but it's sitting on a graphite bench. And uh, we had an overall requirement that depolarization had to be less than, or polarization crossed 
talk had to be less than 1% end-to-end -end on, the, on the mission. So we heard mentioned earlier that po polarization preserving fiber is critical. Um, this was met, but and in the end, this is a graph that didn't come out dark enough here, but it's um, this 1% is up here. But you see some pretty odd behavior, which looks like, and this is about a nine-year time frame here. So you see this odd switching. So this is about 0.1% crosstalk up to 0.8% crosstalk. What was happening is, is that this mount has some induced stresses and some degree of hysteresis. Every time we turn on and off our system, it causes a different level of polar, uh, depolarization in the system. And then the, some general decay. So I'm running short on time. Let me go quickly through this last example. And this is the issue of multi-year missions and a materials example. Um, so you're going to have to, uh, for a medium-sized science mission, you're going to be operating for one to three years after you've been on the ground for a few, um, m maybe a year or two. So here's a gold indide problem that the materials and processing people uh, was discovered afterwards. The uh, a COTS uh, system was you COTS uh, parts were used here, and there was a manufacturing problem where uh, indium was accidentally spread on gold wire bonds. And here's an SEM view of that. What happens is is that it creates an indium gold gold indide, which is a brittle metallic material. It takes about at room temperature, it takes about two or three years to turn that gold into gold indide. In that time, you lose all of your structural strength. Uh, just quickly, there's another one, which is the uh, tin whisker is well known in the labs, but you get plenty of time and space to build up tin whiskers. And this is actually a, a, a tin, tin, it's actually grown out and is touching the uh, a diode laser facet. Here's a diode array where it's actually turning off different, shorting out different ones. Over time on Calypso, we see entire linear arrays or bars go dark, and we've been able to track that decay um, in great detail. So my, my final is suggestions. There's no point, path forward without compelling science that needs to be in space. We have to have reasonable science requirements and goals and a mission architecture with manageable complexity and within a budget. And we don't want to overreach. We can take a disciplined approach to space. We can get new technologies to space. We just have to take an approach which doesn't try to jump to space. And so that means understanding the risks. And then um, finding the money is always a challenge. And then uh, understanding materials and processing and heritage. And um, I would have to say that laser-based systems have had a little bit of a spotty record in space because of their complexity and because of this desire to jump quickly. Well, it works in the lab. Obviously, we can make it work in space. So finally, I think that um, this is an exciting technology and an exciting opportunity here. And um, I think we can enable things if we can find uh, a really compelling science case. And, so thank you to the organizers for putting this workshop together and the Keck Foundation for, for its funding.